Hello. In this video, you will learn about Control Area Network, or CAN, based on a practical example and the development tools available from K2L. Before we dive into this example, let us lay some groundwork with the CAN refresher and an overview of development tools available from K2L that we will use. CAN stands for Controller Area Network. CAN was developed by Bosch in the 1980s. It became an ISO standard in 1993. Since then, it has evolved into one of the most important bus systems for automotive vehicles. It is highly probable that it will remain important for the foreseeable future. In today's cars, typical applications for CAN are to connect the components of the powertrain, chassis or the car body. On the left-hand side, you see a schematical illustration of a CAN system that consists of three devices or nodes. In the following presentation, we will discuss some important characteristics of CAN based on this example. The first thing we can notice is that CAN is a two-wire bus. One wire is often named CAN low and the other CAN high. We will see why in a second. Above the two bus lines, we see the core structure of a CAN node. A CAN node consists normally of a CAN transceiver that converts the voltage levels of a microcontroller into the voltage levels of the CAN bus. The automotive microcontrollers today often feature a so-called CAN controller that implements the data link layer of the CAN protocol. The CAN controller is usually accessed in the user software via the corresponding drivers that often come with the microcontroller. Let's assume the CAN node in the middle wants to send a logical zero over the CAN bus. What happens is that the CAN transceiver changes the voltage level of the CAN high wire from 2.5 to 3.5 volts and the voltage level from CAN low from 2.5 to 1.5 volts. If at the same time a node wants to send a logical 1, which is represented by 2.5 volts on both wires, the 1 gets overridden. This is why the 0 is called a dominant bit in CAN and the 1 is called a recessive bit. Another important characteristic of CAN is that it uses message broadcasting. At the bottom, you see the structure of a regular CAN frame. It consists of a start of frame bit, an arbitration field, a control field followed by the data field that carries the actual payload. Then there is a CRC field that contains the CRC that was calculated for the previously mentioned fields. The acknowledgement field is used by the receiving nodes to indicate if the frame was received correctly. As you can see from the frame structure, there is no field with a source address where the message comes from or maybe, even more importantly, where the destination of the message is. So in other words, in CAN, the messages and frames are transmitted in a broadcast fashion to all nodes in the network. When you look closely at the arbitration field, you see that there is an 11-bit identifier contained. This identifier determines the type of the message rather than the destination, and it is up to the receiving nodes to decide if they want to process the message or not. This message filtering is usually implemented in the CAN controller. The third important characteristic we would like to discuss is the priority-based multi-master access. When there is just a single CAN node that wants to send a message when the bus is idle, there is no problem. It sends a start of frame bit and transmits the frame with the structure we have discussed before. The scenario becomes more interesting if there are two or maybe even more nodes that want to send a message at the same time. And the question that naturally arises is, how can these collisions be resolved? In CAN, the message identifier is used to determine which node is allowed to send. The only thing one needs to bear in mind to understand this is that on CAN, a logical zero is dominant and overrides a logical one. Let's assume that the right node and the middle node in our example want to send a message. At the bottom, we see that the right node sends a start of frame bit to indicate that a message is pending for transmission. The middle node also realises that it wants to send a message and synchronises its clock to start a frame bit of the right node. Then, both nodes send the most significant bit of the identifier at the same time. The right node sends a zero. 
It also reads back the state of the bus, which is a logical zero. The middle node also sends a zero, and likewise reads back a zero. Then both nodes send again a zero for the second bit of the identifier, and both nodes read back a zero. Now the third bit is transmitted. The right node sends a one, and the middle node sends a zero. Because a zero is dominant in CAN, as discussed before, both nodes read back a zero. Now the right node realises that it has lost this arbitration round since it was sending a one and is reading back a zero. The right node then stops sending and in the following just listens to what is going on on the bus. It will try to get the bus for message transmission after the current frame. Overall, the procedure described above means that frames with smaller identifiers have a higher priority than frames with a higher identifier. That is important during CAN system design. So far we have talked about frames with identifiers of 11 bits. This means that the number of message types is limited to 2 to the power of 11, which is 2048. This is the reason why the CAN standard was amended to extend the identifier length to support a larger number of message types. With the extended format, you can define identifiers with a length of 29 bits and have 2 to the power of 29 different message types, which is a lot. You do the maths. One reason that CAN is popular in automotive and other safety-critical domains is the excellent error robustness which is achieved by a combination of several CAN features. When we look at the actual bus wires, CAN high and CAN low, the state of the bus is actually determined by the difference of the voltage levels. If the difference is 0 volts, a 1 is transmitted. If the difference is 2 volts, a 0 is transmitted. This procedure leads to an immunity against electromagnetic interference to a large extent, as usually both wires are influenced. This means the difference of the voltage levels remain the same. When you look at the regular CAN frame at the bottom, you can see that the frame is protected with a 15-bit CRC code, while the data field is just between 0 and 8 bytes. This means that a relatively short frame is protected by quite a long CRC field. And the last feature we want to mention here is that every CAN controller has two error counters, a receive error counter and a transmit error counter. Depending on the counter values, the CAN nodes can conduct something that is called self-retirement. If, for example, one node sends a message and the other nodes in the network indicate an error, the corresponding counter is increased. When a certain counter value is reached, the sending node takes itself off the bus. Before we come to the example, a quick introduction into the development tools we will apply, Optilizer Studio and Optilizer Mocha CL. The Optilizer Mocha CL is a hardware interface that addresses specifically CAN and LIN developments. It offers six CAN interfaces and six LIN interfaces. The Optilizer Studio, in turn, is development software running on the PC. The picture indicates the combination of Optilizer Studio and Optilizer Mocha CL, analysis of what is going on on the bus. The Mocha CL interfaces directly to the CAN bus. On the other side, it is connected via USB to the notebook that is running Optilizer Studio. The second use case goes beyond pure analysis. Here, a CAN node is replaced or simulated by Optilizer Mocha CL and Optilizer Studio. We will see both use cases in a second. Here is the example we want to use in the following. On the right-hand side, you can see a three-phase brushless DC motor that is controlled by a DSPIC DEM MCLV2 development board hosting DSPIC 33E from Microchip. The green motor control board reports the speed of the motor as well as the current that is drawn by the motor over the CAN bus, which is now highlighted in green. On the left-hand side, we see two devices that are also attached to the CAN bus. On the top, we see the Optilizer Mocha CL that we have already discussed. At the bottom, Microchip's CAN bus analyzer is mounted. The CAN bus analyzer interface features one CAN interface and is also supported by Optilizer Studio. Now we come to the Optilizer Studio graphical user interface. 
The first thing we want to look at is the Device Manager, which can be used to change settings of the hardware interfaces that are connected to the PC. In this example, it is a microchip CAN bus analyzer, for which we can set the board rate and enable or disable a terminal resistor. We also see an Optalyzer mocker device with six CAN and LIN interfaces. Of course, we can change the board rate for the CAN interfaces as well and set the transceiver type for two of the interfaces. Another view that can be helpful is the system info view. Here, we can see the current status of the hardware interfaces and obtain some statistics about sent and received messages. The description view, on the other hand, shows additional information about active objects, for example, the firmware versions of the hardware interfaces. But let us start a trace. As you can see, we receive status messages from the motor control board on both hardware interfaces. In the summary and the ID columns, we can see that the identifier of the messages is 256, which is certainly not very descriptive. So let us load a CAN database file in order to allow for disassembling the messages. The first thing to notice is that the summary column has changed and that the messages with ID 256 are status messages from the motor control board. If we want to get more detailed information about a message, we can open the detailed view. In the signals tab, we can see the values of the different signals contained in the payload of the message and drag and drop the signals into the trace view, for example, for the actual rotation speed. Another handy way to find out what is going on in a system is the graph view that can be used to display signal values over time. As you can see, we can again use the detailed view to drag and drop signals into the graph view. Obviously, the motor is not running at the moment as the rotation speed is zero. We can quickly confirm that when we switch to the camera that records the motor control setup. In order to start the motor, we have to send a control message to the motor control board. In the Optalyzer Studio, this is done with the help of activities. So we will first create an activity file. Activities implementing complex timing behaviours can be created graphically in the activity view. In order to send a control message repeatedly, one can select a loop which contains a sequence. In this sequence, we add a message to be sent, select the interface that is used to send out the message, the message ID, and set the payload. In this case, we set the rotation speed of the motor to 5,000 revolutions per minute. In order to specify the interval between the messages, we can add a delay, which here is one second. Then we can start the activity. When we go back to the trace and the graph view, we can now see that the rotation speed that is reported by the motor control board has changed to 5,000 revolutions per minute, so the motor should actually be running. Again, we can confirm this by going back to the camera. Now, when we look into the trace of messages, we also find the control messages sent from the Mocha hardware are highlighted in blue. As you can see, this message has no value for the actual rotation speed signal, which is only contained in the status messages from the board. To make it a little bit more interesting, let us add some more messages and delays to the activity. We have already seen how this can be done. It is also possible to use copy and paste if you want to do it really fast.
So let us add the set value of the rotation speed that is sent in the control messages from the mocker to the signal graph. As you can see, the set rotation speed runs ahead of the actual rotation speed, which is of course no surprise. The last topic we want to cover in this video is filtering. In order to filter some messages out of the recorded trace, we first create a trace file. In the filter view, we can create a new CAN filter by clicking on the corresponding button. Then we have to define a Boolean expression that must be true for the messages in the trace view. The other messages are filtered out. For the definition of the Boolean formula, fields of the CAN frames and the signals as defined in the CAN database can be used. Now we have a filter that selects the messages for which the actual rotation speed is greater than 8000 revolutions per minute and smaller than 12000 revolutions per minute. We call this filter My Speed Filter. In order to activate and use this filter, we go back to the trace view. Below the messages, there is a window that allows us to change the filter settings. When we activate the My Speed filter, we can see that out of the 39,000 messages, 5,700 fulfill the requirements defined by the filter. It is clear that only status messages remain in the trace.